Hello there and welcome to Complete Games with me James. Hope you guys are all doing well and this is going to be the start of my series on the Ark Survival Evolved Explorer Notes. Over the next few videos we're going to be going over all four of the explorers and the notes that they left behind, piecing together all of the information as to what these individuals had to contribute to the island map. Now behind Ark Survival Evolved there is a story and a lore and it is quite rich. It's told from the point of view of four different survivors. Each one of these survivors are from a different period in Earth's history. In the first video in the beginning of this story series we're going to be going over the accounts of Helena Walker. Now she has been confirmed by Wildcard as the character to be riding the raptor on the cover of Ark Survival Evolved. Helena is also the creator of the dossiers in the game. She appears to be a biologist from modern Australia as she mentions the year 2008 in her notes written in English. I'm going to go over all of the notes in order starting with the first note and we'll piece together Helena's account of her journey through the island. I've lost count of how many sunrises I've seen since I've arrived on this island. Hundreds I'd imagine, yet each one seems more beautiful than the last. Sometimes I like to take Athena out just before dawn, watch it while flying through the morning sky. It's these simple moments that I realise how lucky I am. Not that I was unhappy exploring the reefs and rainforests back in Oz, but I wasn't ever going to spot a Bronto stomping about in the outback, was I? Since I got here, I've had the opportunity to study creatures that no other biologist has ever witnessed. I'll always be grateful for that. I've been holding out for a change in the weather before studying the wildlife in this island's peculiar tundra region, but I think it's safe to say it's not forthcoming. Clearly this planet has no axis tilt and therefore no seasons. The ice, the snow, it isn't melting anytime soon. Can't say I'm happy about it. The cold and high are not the best of mates, I can tell you that, but I'll just have to suck it up. The climate during the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods that many of the island's creatures hail from was fairly uniform, so an arctic region is quite the oddity. It'd be plain stubborn of me not to have a Captain Cook. A tribe that calls themselves the Howling Wolves has really made the northern adventure a lot easier. Well, them and Athena. She's right at home here. I don't think I'll ever be able to pay Rockwell for just up giving her to me. And Argentavis. He said our conversations were payment enough, but I still feel guilty. I should remember to collect some floral samples for him while I'm here. Anyway, tagging along with the walls has been a good introduction to the region, but I think I'm ready to be making my own way. I need to observe these animals undisturbed in their natural habitat for long periods of time. What a day, there I am putting finishing touches on the mammoth dossier when all of a sudden a Tyrannosaurus starts attacking the herd. Struth! A Tyrannosaurus raiding through the bloody snow. I asked the howling wolves at the nearest camp and apparently this is a common thing. They're not new to the region, it just doesn't make sense. How can a Tyrannosaurus survive in this climate? And how can the introduction of an apex predator not shift the entire ecosystem? Well, I've combed through more carnivore droppings than I care to calculate and I can't say it's provided many answers. All the predators in this region have very similar diets, with so many different predators hunting the same prey, the populations of all these species shouldn't be sustainable. Yet I've found nothing to indicate any population shift is actually happening. It's just bizarre. The longer I'm here, the more I realise the region shouldn't exist. Its climate is out of sync with the rest of the island. Many of the creatures here are millions of years ahead of the dinosaurs, and the ecosystem is almost static. Something's off. I need to review my notes. Helena, you dipstick. Going through my notes, I've realised that there are more predators than prey across this entire island by almost double. That's the opposite of how any ecosystem is supposed to work. I can't believe it took a Tyrannosaurus frolicking through the snow for me to see this. It's as plain as day. What to make of it? Add in the human factor and it's impossible for this island to continue as it is by natural means. So, what? Is this island's wildlife being monitored and created somehow? I should speak with Rockwell. Maybe he's come to a similar conclusion. I've never thought this island was normal, exactly. I mean, 
the giant obelisks floating in the sky for Pete's sake. Not to mention the cave I found, which hid a platform similar to those found at the base of said obelisks. Well, similar except for those oddly shaped holes that were carved into its podium. I guess I just didn't care about all that, so long as I had my beautiful, unique and untainted ecosystem to study I was happy. But now? No, I shouldn't write it off just yet, not before I arrive at Rockwell's, there's still a chance that my data is off, or that I miss something obvious. I won't give up on my paradise just yet. I really need to visit Rockwell more. He's so energizing to be around someone of his experience that still has so much excitement for his work and talking to him always helps me gain perspective. As for the island's ecological abnormalities, Rockwell reassured me I was jumping to conclusion. He made a great point, just because this place doesn't follow the scientific laws we're used to doesn't mean it follows no scientific laws at all. After all, science is about discovery and new discoveries can invalidate old principles. So, before I latch onto my theory, I need to gather more empirical evidence. Otherwise, I'm no scientist. On Rockwell's recommendation, I'm heading south to start an in-depth study of the island's marine life, with the help of a tribe called the Painted Sharks. Because the ecosystem of the ocean that surrounds the island is separate from the ecosystem on the mainland, correlating patterns between them might help me isolate and understand the island's scientific abnormalities. Also, after freezing my ass off for so long I could really use an extended stay on a tropical island, marine biology was never my strongest field, but I do love the ocean. If nothing else, it should be beautiful there. Painted Sharks have treated me like I'm a bloody queen since they've showed them Rockwell's letter of recommendation. I don't think I've eaten better in my entire time on the island. Not that it's a high bar, I'm a horrible cook. Oh, and they've been a tremendous help with my research, of course. So far my estimates of predator and prey balance are consistent with the ecosystems on the mainland. The water is simply teeming with shoals of megalodons, perhaps that's a side effect of having limited prey. Sharks aren't known as territorial creatures. I'll have to study them further. No answers as to why the megalodons are so territorial, but I was privy to something even more extraordinary. Megalodon mating behavior. No one's ever witnessed great whites rooting around back home, so that alone is monumental, but I got something even better. I know, what could possibly top watching megalodons have a naughty, right? tracking the female. I was able to observe her for almost a full gestation period and get this, it only lasts one week. One week! No wonder the population is so high. These are spitting out pups 44 times the rate of an Aussie Great White. I should compare how they behave in captivity. So, in addition to all the oddities I found with the wild megalodons, here's a real cherry on top. Taming them is a piece of piss and a bit of training and they're more obedient than the family dog. Now, I've heard of sharks getting very rudimentary training over a year or so, but not to this extent, certainly not so easily. Sharks aren't mammals, or even avians, they're fish, they rely more on instinct, or to put it simply, they're not very smart. You shouldn't be able to ride one like a jet ski. I'm trying to keep an open mind like Rockwell suggested, but this just feels wrong. Well. This seals it, just as I thought I'd made some sense of the notes I took while visiting the painted sharks, I spotted a nail in the proverbial coffin. Ruse. A herd of giant ruse were just hopping about the countryside like they've always been there. As much as I love ruse, they just shouldn't be here. Period. They evolved in Oz, and Oz is only 60 million years after the dinosaurs went extinct among a bevy of other marsupials. If I know any genus, it's this one and the Procoptodon should not exist here. This island isn't an ecosystem, it's a zoo. Not too long ago, I thought this place was a far off utopia where I could study all the world's lost wonders. Now that I'm certain it's not natural at all, I have to say, it's lost a lot of luster. Interference from mankind hasn't helped. Most of the tribes have learned to live in harmony with a slice of the island, but some aren't content with that. One is even trying to conquer all the others. And natural or not, 
this ecosystem will not be any better off if it's burned down in some great war. The sunrises are still beautiful though. At least nothing can change that. And that concludes part one of my complete look at the island survivor notes. Don't forget to subscribe if you're new here and we continue Helena's journey through the island map in part two. But until next time, I'm James from Complete Games and I'll see you.